my friends, and welcome to episode 92 of the Kiss Army Nation podcast. I'm Pasquale Vary, one of your hosts. And I am Claris Pera. Welcome to the show, everyone. Fans of horror and Kiss, you'll want to meet our next guest. His resume includes art director at Delirium Magazine, publisher at Phantasm Media, former contributing writer at Fangoria, former designer and illustrator at Heavy Metal Magazine, and he has worked on the official Ace Freely and Kiss magazines. Kiss Army, you need to get to know Brian Stewart. Brian, welcome to the Kiss Army Nation podcast. How's it going, guys? Thanks for having me. Good, good. Nice to see you. So, uh, you know, thank you for being part of the show. This is amazing having you on. Well, great. Hopefully I won't screw it up. <laughs> um, uh, Brian, just to get it going, um, it is clear that uh, you have uh, been heavily influenced by both music and movies, and you find a way to basically merge the two. So um, can you tell us a bit about uh, your movie influences first? Um, yeah, that's actually a super easy question. Um, th the movie that sort of solidified everything for me was, was Night of the Living Dead, the original 68 black and white film. George Romero's, um, I think, American masterpiece. It's not even a, a great horror film. It's a great film. It's one of the greatest American films ever made. And I'll argue till I'm dead with anybody about that. <laughs> I just, I have, I have really, you know, and I've got really deep. It's, it's funny. I'm, I'm based in Texas, like I was telling you earlier before we started, but I have a really strong connection to uh, Pittsburgh and the area where the film was originally made. Um, over the years, I've gotten to be really close with a lot of the people that were actually involved with the film and um, worked directly on other types of projects that actually related to Night of the Living Dead. And years ago, I was actually um, George's uh, webmaster before he passed away. And my company, Phantasm, when we originally launched, I know we, we can get into it more later, but when, when Fangoria sort of crumbled the first time, um, three of us from Fanta three of us formed Phantasm. And the first thing we did was we reached out to George and our, our company was actually built, you know, God bless him in a way on his back. He, he gave us the opportunity to, you know, sort of take his name and run with it to, to, to launch the first issue. And um, sub subsequently we did um, the 50th anniversary official magazine when they did the uh, re-release of the film um, at the Biome Theater in Pittsburgh. Uh, subsequently, we worked on um, some of the special features as a um, production on the Dawn of the Dead box set that just came out in the UK. And, and I keep getting drawn back into the dead. So it's, it's easy to always cite that as not only my favorite film, but a film that was really important in a lot of ways to me. So there's the long answer. Okay, and uh, I guess that that was kind of the, the intro for you and then uh, moving on on time. So which other movies uh, actually uh, had a big impact on you? Well, I mean, um, being a child of the 70s, I think all of us love Star Wars, obviously. Okay. You know, I mean, most of us, you know, most of us normal people love Star Wars anyway. Mm -hmm. um, when I was growing up, I, I, was, I was exposed to a lot of... Um, films my, my parents were re really uh into uh television film you know not like crazy into it but they were uh, well they were great about letting me be exposed to stuff not necessarily at an unnaturally young age but I definitely got to see a lot of um outside the uh maybe outside the lanes of what people were normally watching a little a little sooner mm -hmm. which was great so um just I mean citing films I mean early on uh, everybody loved Ghostbusters but I also loved like things like pieces and deep red. And um, I, I became early on really fascinated with Italian films. And one of my favorite genres is actually the, the either giallos or, or Westerns, like especially Italian Westerns. I can watch pretty much anything from the sixties to the early eighties. If it was produced in Italy or even in Spain, I'm your guy. I'll, I'll watch it until my eyes fall out. Well, that's interesting. Interesting you mentioned that. And uh, yeah, I, I never thought that you were going to mention Italian and, and uh, from Spain, but that's uh, that's quite interesting. So now, uh, Brian, let me let me go through the the music stuff. You know, uh, so um, you know musical influences and 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 how does Kiss fit into all of this for you? Well, I mean, um, 
at the be- I mean, from the beginning, Kiss was basically Superman to me. For some reason, when I first saw, um, you know, I'm I'm 48, so you know, with 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 a live two having come out when it did, I was very young. The first time I saw the gatefold for a live. And, you know, I don't know if you guys, you know, visualize this, but I always was wondering, like, why is Paul Stanley's or that guy with the star on his face, you know, as a kid, why is his arm in the fire? Because of the of the the, you know, the, true, the yeah. perspective on his arm right. it almost looks like his arm is in the fire. And it was it, it was like and all these guys. And I saw this monster and all this fire and these golden cats. And I was like, holy crap, this is amazing. <laughs> and I was I was uh, immersed and obsessed from then on, you know, what? The color forms, the dolls, all that stuff. I had to have the lunchbox for school. And when I was a kid, I there was an issue of Fangoria that Gene Simmons was in, and I would take it to school until it finally fell apart. I was I was obsessed. So Kiss was a huge influence. Um, the Ramones were a huge influence. Um, big Kiss, Big Ramones. Um, you know the Beatles. I mean, it's like you know that was pretty much my musical holy trinity. Oh well. Okay. You know, I, I think growing up that was. That was it. Obviously, I, I love I love metal. I love you know like Anthrax is one of my my favorite bands. Uh, Danzig was a huge influence, and um, so I mean I, I spread out eventually, but yeah, you know like recently I can't think of a lot of things that really excite me. Obviously, you know I, I can still listen to George Harrison or David Bowie daily, but as far as newer bands, I would say there's a band in um, England. I'll give a shout out that everybody should check out called the Zootons. So the Zootons? there you go. Okay. Yeah is really cool because i'm a i'm a horror movie buff myself and 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 i you know what i love about this podcast you know sometimes and that it's not just about kiss but it's kiss related and it's a springboard to other to other avenues or other or other um interests and for me for sure i mean we're all all well-rounded people and we all love different things but it's easy to sort of have that one thing that connects us and then we branch out from there but it's really incredible how a lot of KISS fans have a lot of things in common. If you talk to most KISS fans, yeah, we're horror movie fans, sci-fi fans, uh, hard rock fans. You know, it, we're all part of that uh, that same community. It's, a, it's really cool. And it's cool talking to you about a lot of these interests outside of KISS, like, for example, horror. Now, having said that, I want to ask you a question. What are your thoughts about the 1978 Dawn of the Dead? That's one of my favorite horror movies. Dawn of the Dead is honestly... It, it doesn't get any better, man. I mean, it's basically Starsky and Hutch in hell, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, really, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like a comic book. Um, it, it really is like you take Starsky and Hutch, you throw them into a comic book and send them straight to hell. Right. And it's such it. a great film. And there were so many, you know, like really cool messages that played out, yeah. you know, in the, in the narrative that were, were said, but not said. You know, and it was just such an interesting take on commercialism. And funny side story, a few years ago, I was actually in Monroeville in the mall where they shot the film. In the, in oh, the wow. Monroeville mall. And we actually were doing a convention called um, Living Dead Weekend. And I was on a stage in the middle of the Monroeville mall with Greg Nicotero. The, the you know, if you're familiar with, he yeah. actually worked yeah. on Day of the Dead, yeah. and a, yeah. you know, and Creep Show. And he actually runs Creep Show now and worked on the walking dead yeah and tom yeah. savini so we're we're having so the three of us are sitting on this stage in the monroeville mall talking about dawn of the dead and the anniversary of dawn i think it was the 40th anniversary at the time of dawn and we were discussing discussing the film and talking about george's take on capitalism while capitalism was taking place around us the mall was open people were buying <laughs> bras and baseball bats and shoes and you know underwear and dresses and you know just doing the consuming that they do like zombies while we're talking about it was really a surreal oh, wow. <laughs> that's so, funny <laughs> kind of funny you know but but that's what i got out of that movie as well when you see those zombies walking through the halls of the of the mall it's like it's like people they're just yeah, mindlessly yeah. going, walking out, not knowing where they are, what to do to just aimlessly walk into malls. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And I don't mean, and I, I don't tell it. that story as like a name drop. I mean, it was like the, the moment wasn't, you know, lost on me. I was like, this is so surreal. We're talking yeah. about George talking about this in the place while it's literally happening. <laughs> and it is around. happening right it now. It's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. So now bringing it back to Kiss. Uh, being a movie buff yourself, what are your thoughts about uh, Kiss Meets the Phantom? And do you consider that a cult classic today? Of course. 
you know, I think I probably like it better than Paul Stanley would admit he likes it. You right. know? <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I, when I was a kid, I was at my grandmother's house and I was sitting there, you know, on the floor with my popcorn or whatever, you know, waiting for it to come on. And I, I believe it actually came on opposite Cleopatra that night, or it was another, it was a big movie of the week or kiss. And we obviously watched the more important of the two. Of course. Um, what was the movie of the week that night? Maybe it wasn't Cleopatra. Anyway, anyway, but yeah, it was like on this black and white TV at my grandmother's house. And I absorbed this thing and I was like, Oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing ever. And I got older and I realized it wasn't the greatest thing ever, but it's still pretty awesome. You know, it, it really for the time for a, a TV movie of the week, it could have been a whole lot worse. Mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and and i think it if you take it for almost like a scooby-doo type mystery of the time how can you not enjoy it yeah it's <laughs> pretty good exactly yeah, and true. you know anthony zerb is amazing as yeah. as devereau so you know yeah. there you go hey brian this is so much fun man this is i think it is going to be longer than what we expected but hey um, i've got some time i've got a bottle of go. water I'm, I'm with you let's go beautiful beautiful um let me just go back to what Pask mentioned uh, in the intro. So you really have a, a very impressive uh, resume. So Thank can you. you tell our listeners about your work as uh, art director at uh, Delirium Magazine? Yeah. So um, de- again, sorry for the long answers. Delirium oh, is um, actually ran by my good friend, Chris Alexander for Full Moon Entertainment. Uh, that's Charles Band's film company. And Chris and Charlie started a magazine years ago. And I started off as a contributing writer. And then I actually wrote a um, column for a while. And then I moved, I I felt like I'd said all I could say with this silly column that I was doing. So I moved on. And then Chris and I actually launched Phantasm. So we did that for a while. And then Chris decided that he was going to just stick doing Delirium. So my wife and I now do publish the Phantasm magazines. And recently, Chris reached out and asked if I wanted to come back to Delirium as the art director. So now I'm laying out the magazine, as well as doing some contributing writing. As I'll be contributing some writing as well. But so it's I'm I'm back at I'm back at Full Moon and I'm back working with Chris and it's awesome. I, I love Chris. He's 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 like a brother. He's 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 good people. So you know, getting to work with him again, is, it's great. You know, getting to sort of flex those creative muscles, designing the Phantasm books. And the delirium books, I can sort of play in two lanes without crossing the streams, you know, sort of like mm. Ghostbusters. Right. <laughs> yeah. Bring it around like good comedy. Exactly. <laughs> it's true. So you you um you know the timing is perfect. So you you mentioned actually fantasy media. So can, can you give us some uh, insight on uh, on your role there, what you guys are doing, what you did yeah. in the past? Yeah. So uh, Phantasm is is my my wife and I at this point. Uh, we're the publishers, and everything is at this point single subject magazines. So, if you buy a magazine, you know it's like about Texas. Like, a, say, if we did the uh, well for the tribute to Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it's the Texas Chainsaw Legacy. That's all that's in the issue. So, if you okay. buy it, you're a chainsaw fan. You're not going to get oh well, what's this Freddy Krueger stuff at the back? You know, it's like it's only that subject. Um, Night of the Living Dead was the same way, Romero. And we've gone to the Romero well a few times. And um, it's it's been great. We did one just on Italian films. We're going to we're gonna roll back and do that again. You know, I, I may go to that well a few times. I, I Like I said, I, I have a really deep love for that. And our second issue was with uh, Scream Queen Linnea Quigley, who a lot of people are familiar with. And we're actually remastering and re-releasing that issue. It unfortunately has taken a little longer than planned, you know, with a few different things, you know, in, Linnea actually got injured and we didn't have everything we needed from her as far as an interview at the time. So we didn't want to bug her while she was recovering okay. with her leg injury. And then we've had, you know, just some other things as far as getting the collected information we needed to get that one out. So it's been a little behind, a little frustrating, but that one's back on track and coming out soon. And we've got some other stuff in the works. I don't want to, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag yet as far as what's coming next, but uh, Phantasm moves at the speed it moves at because we we don't have a publishing schedule that we're forced to follow uh, mm-hmm. since we do it and we'll release them when they're when they're perfect or at least as perfect as we can get them. When they come out, we want them to feel like there was a lot of love and and blood, sweat, and tears put into them, and people get them and they say, okay, we see where where the twenty dollars went. 
Fantastic. I, I remember as a kid, I used to collect uh, Fangoria magazines. I used to have a, a stack of them, and and I, I wish I still uh, kept them to this day, man. Because I remember I used to I used to choose my movies based on what I saw in Fangoria. It's like, oh, this sounds really cool. I'm gonna look and I look up the movie and I try to to check it out. And we had an old repertoire cinema here in Montreal called Cinema Five. And at the time, I was under eighteen, so I used to go there to catch all the eighteen plus movies that I saw in Fangoria. And it was just uh, a trip, man. I, cool, I, man. I just loved it. So it's really cool uh, to have you here. And you were a contributing writer uh, for Fangoria Magazine. How did you get involved with that magazine? Well, at the time, uh, like I mentioned, Chris earlier that runs uh, Delirium, Chris was actually the editor-in-chief at Fango at the time. And Chris and I had become friendly. And, um, you know, Chris and I were actually both huge KISS fans. Huge KISS fans, both of us. And we happen to be at a couple of conventions, you know, in different places, you know, because, you know, there's a different horror or film convention in some city every weekend. And Chris and I were together at a convention and he um, wanted to meet Ace Fraley and I knew Ace. So I took him back and he met he met Ace. And then he was like, well, yeah, I want you to meet George. So he took me back to meet George, you know, George Romero. And so we sort of like swapped favors, you know, because he, he had known George for a long time and they were really good friends. And and. And I told Chris that I, you know, was a, you know, obviously huge fan of Fangoria and I, you know, worked previously at Heavy Metal and a few other independent magazines, comics, and I'd love to be a part of Fangoria if it made sense. And so I had done like some illustrations that were used in Fango um, and Gorezone. Let me try, I'm trying to remember how this went. Um, I think mostly, most of the stuff ended up as, uh, Centerfolds and Gore Zone, the sister magazine. And then Chris was like, hey, since you know Ace, um, and we were talking about how cool it was that Gene Simmons was in Fangoria years ago. He said, well, you know Ace, why don't you why don't you call Ace and do an Ace interview? And that was, so literally my first thing to contribute to Fangoria was bringing another member of KISS to Fango. So that was pretty cool. Nice. So, that's how that all started. And also recently you've been... Um... Well, you, you, I know you, you do illustrations, and recently after we got in touch, you and I, I, I noticed that you were posting more and more of your uh, illustrations online. Tell us a little bit about your work as an illustrator and your work at the Heavy Metal magazine. Well, um, originally with, with Heavy Metal, um, at the time it was published by Kevin Eastman. He, Kevin owned it, the guy that created the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I had actually known his wife at the time, Julie Strain, who was the 93 penthouse pet of the year. And so that, and Julie recently passed away. Um, and Julie was actually one of the best people. She was actually the, sort of the, the linchpin to everything that I'm doing now in a way. And I won't go into this long convoluted story, but having known Julie, she helped me connect with Kevin and a filmmaker named Andy Sedaris. And um, that was sort of the catalyst for me working at heavy metal. And then I ended up actually doing art direction on the Andy Sedaris book that heavy metal released. So it was sort of a, you know, it was one of those who, you know, things. And, you know, subsequently I did a lot of, um, independent comic work, um, licensed, uh, film poster stuff, um, for like, uh, Grindhouse, um, Severin, you know, different uh, independent labels, and then obviously Gorezone, Fangoria, um, probably some others that I'm not remembering right now. Mm -hmm. I did some, obviously, some Delirium covers, um, and then Phantasm. <laughs> I, I, I lean more into digital work, but I, I, uh, I approach it in a completely traditional, practical way. Um, I do, like I said, work digitally if I'm painting like a cover mm -hmm. or a painting or a poster. But I, I would work the same way I would work in acrylics or oils as far yeah. as even underpainting, you know, as far as black and white first and then laying in my, you know, color, my lighting values, all that. I, you know, it's probably boring to everybody, but, you know, that's, that's how I do it. Uh, I'm actually curious, um, as an illustrator yourself, what are your, what's your view on the latest AI technology and graphic design? I'm hearing some controversy about that. Um, I think AI as a tool, such as um, maybe like old film and photo retouching, being able to go in and, you know, find detail. And like they've even used AI to find some 
uh, some clarity and some old audio recordings. I think all that is awesome. I love technology. I think technology is great. But I think AI, as far as the basis for creation of art, and I don't say this just because I'm an artist, I, I, I'll say that it is one of the worst things to happen because, again, not just because I'm an artist, but because I am a creator. And a lot of people that create intangibles are often the first people they're stolen from. Everybody remembers years ago when Napster uh, oh, yeah. was a big thing. Yeah. And everybody wanted to say Metallica were these assholes for um, having a problem with this. Well, it didn't matter how much money Metallica had. The problem was people were stealing their money. It doesn't matter how rich you are. If you're being stolen from, it's still stealing. And if it's a copyrighted thing, whether it's an intangible like a, a song, you obviously can't hold a song. You can hold a record. It's You obviously can't, you know, that's but that's not the point. The moment you digitize it, people think it's something that they can just take. And that's just not simply not how it works. And, you know, AI is heading the same way, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I think that with Napster, everybody started trading and stealing and stealing music. And after that, you know, uh, CD sales tanked. And I think, I think a lot of the uh, concert ticket prices that were ratcheted up, um, Bands have to do something if it's a, the sh you know, shirts are 50 bucks and tickets are a hundred dollars plus now. Well, they've got to do something to make an income because nobody buys CDs anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that people do download music legally now, but I think Napster was the beginning of having to renegotiate how to make a living if you were a creative, especially in the music industry at that time. I think the same thing is going to happen with AI because the way my understanding of most of the AI programs work is they crawl the internet, they look at photos and other art, and then they basically mm -hmm. take and remix that into a new image. Yeah. So basically yeah. that'd be like somebody, let's say you're a, uh, let's say you're an accountant and somebody shows up at your office with an iPhone and can type a sentence on an iPhone that basically steals two other accountants work and does your job for free. And then you're fired because they don't need you anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not just about me, you know, saying boohoo, you're stealing or you're taking from me. It's about the fact that you're literally taking somebody else's work and monetizing it for free. So uh, yeah, I think I, I fully agree with that. You know, uh, the, 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 I, I have to say the smooth and, and not so smooth introduction of uh, AI now in every domain. Uh, that's going to hit, you know, uh, big time, you know, on the art, you know, business uh, where that that, uh, that you're in, whether if it's music, painting, you know, illustration or or editing, you know, it's it's going to be, uh, I think at the beginning it's going to be drastic, but then things are going to kind of uh, get so. stable. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, at the beginning it's going to be, it's going to yeah. be a little and bit. And I think problem. there's a learning curve with everything. Um, and it's not that I'm, you know, I'm yeah. definitely not nasty about it. I think with any new technology, everybody's always a little resistant at first, yeah. but I think we have to get the stealing out of our, out of our system as humanity first. Yeah. We've all exactly. got to see, see what the, what the edges or the limits are before we sort of write the ship. And it seems like we do that every time. Yeah. Yeah. True. True. Well said. Um, Brian, I, I, I know that KISS fans would love to hear about your work on the official KISS magazine and poster book. Can you tell us about that experience, please? Yeah, that was a really fun experience. Um, we, we just reached out to Gene directly and said, hey, you know, we'd love to do this. We love the, the poster books in the 70s, you know, where you'd fold out these giant wall sized posters and, and Gene loved the idea. And interestingly enough, um, I worked directly with him. I mean, we would literally every page I designed, I'd send straight to Gene, you know, and, and he was, um, and I'm not saying this because it's going to be public record, but in all honesty, he is one of the easiest people I have ever dealt with. I mean, he could not be more pleasant to deal with. He's, he's, he's fun. He's very, I mean, he's very much a businessman, but he is very um, enjoyable to deal with and, and, and really uh, great to deal with on a creative level. So, I mean, I, and I'm not, like I said, I'm not just saying this because it's public record. It's the truth. I mean, there, I've dealt with a lot of people in a lot of creative positions and there's a lot of pushback or, but I think Gene was very open to um, seeing where it could go. And he, if anything, he more just sort of would guide a bullet 
or just say, hey, the bullet looks like it's going to hit good enough, you know, so, but he was great. And I still actually do a few KISS projects here and there. So it's, it's, I'm, I, it's unfortunate that the, the poster books, you know, came to an end with COVID, but it just sort of timing just sort of worked out that way. But, you know, we're still, you know, we're still chugging along. Well, that, that was my next question. I, I, I wanted to know if you have uh, still some ongoing projects with, uh, with, with Gene and, uh, and with, the, with Kiss, with the band. Um, well, hopefully there's going to be a lot of stuff coming out for the 50th uh, anniversary. So who knows? Huh? Maybe there's something in the works. Who knows? Um, I can't say that um, a lot of the picks for the, the end of the road tour, I did design quite a few of those. And for the last one or maybe two Kiss Cruises, I don't remember. Hmm. I designed a uh, the last two Paul Stanley guitars that he had for the Kiss Cruise meet and greets. Um, I do a lot of uh, different smaller projects, you know. But, you know, nothing is as intense, obviously, at this point as the poster book. But it's nice to still be in the loop. You know, I, I know that growing up, like I said, Kiss was like Superman. So just getting to be, you know, like, quote unquote, in the room and getting to, you know, contribute in some way. It's a lot of fun because I'm, I'm, I'm still a fan. I'm absolutely a fan. Of course, of course. And uh, Brian, you mentioned before, uh, you know, uh, uh, knowing Ace uh, pr pretty well. So you work on, on the Ace Freely magazine. So uh, let me ask you, how was that experience different from working on the Kiss magazine? Well, um, to make a Ghostbusters joke, um, we were doing a project with Kiss. So at the same time, we were doing a project with Ace. So it was very much like with Ghostbusters, you don't cross the streams. You know, so I've used that joke twice now, but it's <laughs> but it's really it's true. Um, we very much work to make them different products, um, both visually and stylistically, f flavor, everything. You know, Kiss was very much celebrating um, the band as a whole. Ace was very much about celebrating Ace as a piece of that history, but also the solo artist. So it was very important to make that distinction and how we approach the projects. But it was really cool because um, we had Kiss and on, one, on one side and with Ace on the other, and Peter was um, gracious enough to be a part of the project. So we had Ace and Peter, Gene Paul, Tommy and Eric over here. So it was really wow. cool. <laughs> and with the Ace um, magazine, I was able to get you know uh, Michael Sweet, um, John Five and my friend Charlie from Anthrax uh, in the magazine talking about, you know, sort of like how Kiss and Ace influenced them. And it was it was a lot of fun. It was it was an interesting it was an interesting experience to be able to do both at once. That's for sure. I mean, I would say that that's. What are the chances, right? You know, what are the chances? That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. OK, so it's uh, it's confession time. Um, OK, I remember you messaged me on Instagram telling me how much you love the show and you'd love to be on the podcast. And, you know, I'm not very handy with, uh, with Instagram. So it was months later that I, I finally messaged you back and go, Oh my God, I'm sorry, Brian. I just saw the message. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. I'd love to have you on the show. And I remember how I, I'm impressed I was with, um, with your resume. You monster. How dare you make me wait? <laughs> <laughs> it was almost a year, wasn't it? Oh my god! You know, I don't remember. I, I just remember. I rem I do remember messaging you because uh, I'm I'm always excited to talk kiss, and I love to hear myself talk. Obviously, you know I, <laughs> I don't shut up. That's exactly what you said. That you love to talk about kiss, and you love to come on the show and talk about kiss. So yeah. you're here now. Let's talk more about kiss. Woo. So tell us, um, do you have any stories to share about your most memorable kiss experience? You know, I have to say the um, non non professional um, being front row when the curtain dropped the on the reunion tour, seeing them in makeup again for the first time was like I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. You know, I even having you know, pardon me you know, had the experiences I've had subsequently, that moment was just like being struck by lightning. You know, it was like, here I am six feet away, Ace Paul, Gene Peter, they're, it's ba they're back. 
and it's like I'm a kid again. And that was, that's probably one of the most striking kiss related moments, you know, even having, you know, met them, you know, and, and worked with them in so many different aspects that still stands out, you know, is, is pretty cool. Now I will say I've seen the band so many times. And I think the funniest thing was the last time we saw them, I, um, I didn't tell anybody we were coming because they were going to be near where we happened to be at the time. So I just, I just bought tickets for the, for me and my kids and my wife didn't, didn't send Gene a message, nothing, and just showed up. It just, I wanted, I wasn't doing any, because every time I'd seen them in recent years, I always was up front with taking photos for the books or, you know, whatever. And I just wanted to take in the end of the road show like a fan. And we were probably 20 rows back, maybe. And, you know, during, during um, the end of the show, when the cranes come out over the crowd, Gene spots me in the crowd. Oh wow! And 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 waves and starts throwing picks at me, and <laughs> and and I, and, that, and my son looked at me and he said, "Dad, out of all these people, what the hell?" <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have to say it. that was pretty freaky, you I know. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty cool, you know, being being spotted. That was that was kind of that was again one of those eight year old moments. It doesn't matter that I know Gene. It's still you know in the moment. It's it's still kiss. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Brian, I can see behind you, you have a bit of a, of a movie collection. A little um, bit. You know, most KISS fans are, are, are KISS collectors. So my question to you is, um, do you have a, a horror movie collection? And do you consider yourself a KISS collection? Do you have anything KISS related? Oh, Aquan era? I've got... It'd be quicker to tell you what I pretty much don't have. I don't have the model van. Mm -hmm. I don't have the guitar and I don't have the record player. That's about it. Oh, wow. Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah. It, that's really about it. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. We, nice. should come, we, we should come for a visit soon. Oh, oh my nice. Goodness. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. Now, and I, actually, I just recently sold all my belt buckles. So I don't have the belt buckles anymore. I had the majority of the, of the probably more well-known Pacifica belt buckles, you know, the, the love gun, yeah, and the destroyer rock and roll. I recently sold those because it's at some point you have too much, you know. Yeah. Even even kiss stuff and a finite amount of space. So I did yeah. recently yeah. let go of the belt buckles. I've considered maybe letting go of a few other things, but probably not going to happen. Okay, okay. Um, uh, Brian, let me just uh, uh, be part of, of of this question too. What, when when is the first time that you uh, that you attended a show that you saw kiss? What was the first time? Uh, you recall? No. You know, um, um, I actually never got to see them uh, in makeup on the first go around. Oh, oh, that that's why the reunion tour was so yeah. I think was that so was shocking. Why the reunion tour was so oh. striking. Okay. Um, I will say, um, on the '95 convention tour, mm. I was um, there, and I had stepped, I'd stepped on some glass and cut my foot up real bad, so I was on crutches. And at the end of the convention, you know, they would do the acoustic set, and everybody would just basically rush the stage with, with stuff to be signed. And Gene saw that I was on crutches and he's sort of getting pushed around. I'm, I'm a pretty good sized guy, but you know, when there's a crowd, you really doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're, you're gonna. And so Gene had security get me and put me up on stage. With with them so my oh, wife wow. and Jean okay. my wife and I got to you know stand and hang out with Jean and and visit with them and that was that was pretty cool and that was the first time I had actually met you know met Jean obviously he wouldn't remember that but wow that was pretty cool. <laughs> what a moment oh yeah. my goodness <laughs> uh, uh Brian so uh, um as past mentioned before so you being an, an, an illustrator um we're interested to know what your thoughts are on the kiss comics that have come out over the years it'll it will always be for me those first two marvel specials you know that and like that you know, that beautiful bob larkin painting on the number two with them in the in the the hand it doesn't get any better than that right, right. so so those, that's your you know, i think those are probably always going to be you know top shelf for me uh, I did. I did really enjoy the uh, uh, the McFarlane run with Psycho Circus. I mm -hmm. thought there were some really great notes that they touched on in that series. Um, that one, um, 
would probably be a close second for me. I think that, that was that was some really great stuff there. I, I think that, you know, there have been some other ones that have definitely stood out. But, you know, for me, the original two and then that um, Psycho Circus run were probably what I would consider the uh, the high points. Got it. Got it. And and this is uh, this is a tough one. So if you were to create your own Kiss comic book, what, uh, what would it look like? I'm not telling you. <laughs> Ouch, right? You're on the show. That's right. It's true. Good point. <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm teasing. No, but it's funny you mentioned that. In all seriousness, now I've obviously not talked to anybody in licensing. I've not mm. approached Gene with this idea, but I I have actually had a couple of off the cuff conversations with um, some friends of mine that have worked on Kiss Comics in the past about what we would do if we could take it forward and and that's you know friends and beer in conversation and probably nothing more but i will say we've definitely we've there's been a conversation but not amongst okay. anybody mm -hmm. with the band or any of the licensing people okay but you know i mean as far as what it would look like um hopefully good hopefully it would look good <laughs> i'm sure it would be good we're sure it would, it would be good you know, the trick would be having to go back and really seriously, seriously reread everything that's been done and not tread on anybody's shoes because there have been some great stories told and they're not all in continuity. You know, there are a lot of standalone tales and you don't want to retread any of that and you, you know, want to let all that be what it is. And I think the trick would be to come up with something that, that really has its own voice. And yeah, I think new, that would new be and fresh. a yeah, fun challenge, point. Yeah. you know. Good point. Yeah. Brian, you might have some insight on this. I, I love collecting Kiss comics, and I pretty much have all of them. And like you, I love the Psycho Circus because it really told an amazing story, but it told that story in, what was it, 31, 32 issues. But the recent Kiss comics, it starts off strong. After five or six, they disappear. Right? The story just, it goes it goes nowhere. Now, do you know, what do these, why do these comic books just abruptly end like that? Is it because of sales? Is it a decision that the illustrator or, the, or what is it? To be perfectly candid, I really don't know. Uh, I will say with so many things, um, publishing's tricky. And as, as popular as, as even Kiss is, especially as close to our hearts, there are books um, throughout the years that we think of as popular books or we would assume are really great sales tool books they get canceled you know anything it could be anything from creative differences to an editor moves to another book to there could be slumping sales i mean some of the marvel superhero books over the years were canceled as were dc's superhero books canceled over slumping sales and these are superheroes that are on kids t-shirts and lunch boxes that everybody knows you know mm -hmm. they're just those moments and i'm not saying that that's what happened i'm just saying there's there are definitely numerous reasons that it could have happened and some simply could be that there was a license it could be let me be clear could be that there was a finite license meaning mm -hmm. that you know like with so many things you know, like you may want to do a Friday the 13th comic book, just just pulling a name out of the hat. And they may say, well, OK, well, that's fine. We have another movie coming out in X years. So we're going to give you X years between this movie and this movie to fill the gap for the fans. And once we're ready to ramp up this production, you, yours is done. And, I'm, you know, th things like that in publishing that are tied to an outside license do happen. Again, I'm not. I'm not speculating that that's what happened with KISS, but I will say I do know for sure, having worked on licenses, that a lot of times licenses are very finite amounts of time, and they may be blocked in in amongst other products that you, you can only sell, you know, if a kid's got 50 cents, you can only sell him so many 25 cent items mm -hmm. at a time, yeah. right? So, you know, you have to, that's, that's a, a, a point you have to look at when you're selling to an audience, you can only you can only put so many things up for sale at one time before the pocket's empty. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that could that could pretty well be uh, just part of the of the business case, you know, for the publishing yeah. company. Yeah, that 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 could be. <laughs> but what I don't get is like a magazine gets gets canceled, like a comic book gets canceled, and then another publishing company creates another one. There's only five five issues. Another company. I mean, do they talk to each other? What? 
Is it like, okay, give us room for this project, give us room for this project? It simply could be that a company um, licensed it for a certain amount of time to do a certain arc. And then, you know, and again, not speaking to the KISS license, just licensing in general. Right. Mm -hmm. That if, let's say that we have this license here and this company wants it, they take that license mm -hmm. and they paid for a year. This Then company number two shows up and goes, you know what? We'll give you two extra dollars to take that license. And hey, when the license is up for renewal, the person with the license goes two more dollars. Heck yeah. And then it jumps to company B. So again, uh, not speaking to the KISS license, but licensing in general, there are bidding wars. Okay, so I know that. again, all speculation. Right, right. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, now, going back to um, Claudio's theme of, of, you know, what if, um, you mentioned that you're, you're working on, on uh, KISS-related projects, and you probably can't talk about that, right? What well, they are. There's, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing mind-blowing. I mean, it's, it's small stuff, but it, it keeps me busy. Right, right. And it'll keep us happy. That's for sure. <laughs> if it's Kiss, it'll keep us happy. Okay. So my question to you is, if you were, if you could work on a Kiss related project, what would be your Holy Grail project to work on? Album cover. Oh, oh yeah. Wow. Nice. nice. That's a good one. Don't even have to think about it. Wow. Nice. You know, that's, uh, you know, album cover. That's something I haven't done. I've gotten to do magazine covers I've gotten to do two sets of trading cards that had my design, my art, and my photos. I've gotten to do the guitar picks. And it's like, oh, look what I'm not. I don't mean to be like, oh, look what I've done. But the one thing I've never gotten to do, obviously, is an album cover. But, you know, the thing is, nobody is ever going to climb the mountain and top what Ken Kelly did. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's better that I don't do it because I'll net, I don't, I'm not even worthy to climb that mountain. I mean, Ken Kelly was yeah. a master <laughs> among men as far as the stuff he did for Creepy and Eerie. And then, you know, obviously Love Gun and Destroyer. And a great guy to boot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. An awesome yeah. Guy. So you never had any discussions with uh, with Gene or, or the band, you know, to, to jump on it, you know, when they released uh, Sonic Boom or Monster? Or oh, no, 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 no. No, I came after Sonic Boom. Oh, okay. 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 But I tell you, if, um, even though I, I feel like I would never do justice to Ken Kelly, if they asked me to do it, I'd do it. Of course. <laughs> oh, yeah. No kidding. I'd be happy to screw it up for them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Brian, this is so much fun. But, uh, you know, we, we, anyways, we, we have to, we're going to wrap up the show with one final question. And uh, uh, for you, um, uh, basically, you, you mentioned, you know, the cover, but uh, what, what would you what would you like to say to to Kiss fans? I know that you're a huge Kiss fan, and uh, you know you have so many different venues that you're working on on, on art. But uh, is there any special message that you would like to to send to the Kiss fans, the Kiss family? I, you know, I think when it really comes down to, we're all the same. We're all kids that grew up in a time. You know, especially well, I'm I'm speaking. You know, to people my age we all grew up in a time where, where data wasn't thrown at us as fast as it is now. And a lot of us grasped onto certain things and we grew up with these things and they've changed and become almost like part of the fabric of who we are. And, you know, just, you know, we're all the same. I mean, we all, we all love something. And if it's, you know, it's okay. It's okay to love something as much as, as, as so many kiss fans do, because in, in in a world that's so full of shitty things and shitty yeah, people, yeah, yeah, if there's yeah. something that makes you feel good and, you know, if it's a, you know, a, a moment to take a break from the stress of the day and you hear a kiss song and it makes you feel good. Hey, it's, you know, great. Good for you. I know it's, you know, it's, it's nice. That's it's nice funny. to take a break sometimes. And it's, you know, Hey, if it's four guys in high heels and makeup that does the job <laughs> even better. <laughs> How do you feel about the, uh, you know, the band, you know, uh, you know, the road and, you know, not touring anymore. I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of KISS, you know, stuff going on and uh, the band will still be alive. But how do you feel about, you know, the band not, not touring anymore? Uh, ugh. When I first heard about it, um, I heard about it before it was public knowledge. And it was just, 
in the moment, it was a gut punch. It was like, oh, and obviously nothing lasts forever. People don't last forever. But just the idea of final, you know, that final moment or realizing something that you care about is finite. Nobody ever wants that moment to be there, whether it's your your dog or, you know, even the end of summer. You know, we don't like anything that we enjoy to end. So, I mean, that's going to be hard. But the beauty of it is, is, you know, the music's always going to be there. It's just like people that don't like movie remakes. It's like, you know, it'll be okay if you don't like the new Star Wars. The old one's there. You can turn it on anytime. So just like the music, if Kiss isn't on the road anymore, turn on a CD. It'll be it'll be okay. And I mean, my God, they've earned a break. You know, it's oh, just yeah. like uh, yeah. we saw Ozzy retired recently. You know, it's, it's okay. I think he earned it. You know, at some point, it's okay to take your shoes off, kick back, and appreciate your legacy. Yeah. And, you know... It may suck for us, but they've earned it. Yeah, we had the time to enjoy it, you know, and now yeah. it's time to, you know, we celebrate it and then, uh, you know, that's right. Yeah, you're right. But I, but I will say this. I wouldn't be surprised, you know, I, I, um, I'm not making any predictions about, you know, I think the end of the road is going to really be the end of the road for KISS. I'll be surprised if we don't see Gene out doing solo shows pretty oh, soon. Oh, for though. sure. I, I, I. I think that man will die on stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he, he loves to perform. And, I, you know, God bless him, you know. No, I, I think we're going to see a lot of Kiss-related stuff going on after the end of the road. Uh, you know, Paul with Stole Station, Gene with his solo band. Merchandising will never stop. You know, so it, it's the end of the touring road, but it's not the end of Kiss. And, 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 no, no. and also what Kiss fans stuff do. You can throw your quarters at. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> So before we uh, we call it a night, Brian, um, you know, it couldn't be clear that there's so much more we can talk about. You've got so much going on. You're juggling so much at once. Uh, where can our listeners find and explore some of your amazing work? Well, number one, thank you for calling it amazing. Um, it is. <laughs> if you go to my website, which is my name, brianstewart.com, B-R-I-A-N, steward with a D, dot com. Or they can go to phantasm, F-A-N-T-A-S-M, media.com nice and, and feel free to spend all your money don't worry about your electric bill just, just <laughs> spin 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 <laughs> spin an art that's right yeah <laughs> love it love it hey Brian, so you guys want to go another six hours <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Brian, this has been so much fun. A, a true pleasure, man, to get to know you and uh, know about your work and everything that you're involved in. And uh, part of the family, as, as we always say, you know, being a KISS fan is like we've known each other forever. Uh, so it's been uh, it's been awesome. You know, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Hey, guys, thanks for having me on. It was a lot of fun. Maybe we can do it again down the road. Absolutely. Now, hopefully, you know, when you message me back, it won't take another year to, to, to respond. Um, I'll be offended if it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you know, I, I again, I saw that message. How many months later? I'm so glad that I did contact you. I got to know you, um, and we got you on the show to talk about um, what you do. And I think fans are going to get a kick out of getting to know you and 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 get to know about your projects. And it was really, it was surreal for me as a kid collecting Fangoria. Now here you are with worked. In, on Fangoria magazine, and that we have the same love of uh, of horror movies. You know, it's it's really. I, nice. That's what I was saying earlier. I think I think we're all the same. I mean, I think we, you know, we're all fans of something. And I've talked. I've I've even had this conversation with Gene. You know, Gene and I have talked comics, and you know the things that he's fa a fan of. We're all fans of something. We're all excited about. There's always that that one thing that gets us excited, and we want to keep talking about. So, you know, I, it, none of it's lost on me. I, I know how much of a blessing it's been or, or luck or however you look at it to get to do all the things I've gotten to do. And I'm, yeah. I'm so yeah. grateful for it. And we're grateful to have you on, this, on the show. Thank you so Absolutely. much once again. It's, it's Thank been you. a pleasure. It's been a blast. Thank you. To the KISS Army, we hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas, please send them to talk to me at KISSArmyNationPodcast.com. Until the next time, remember, never stop rocking. Take care, everyone. If you enjoyed this episode, like and subscribe on YouTube or follow us on Spotify, Automatic, iHeartRadio, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to make yourself heard. 
leave us a comment on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. See you all soon, Kiss Army.